If you thought that journalists were done attacking fans over Lord of the Rings, you have seen nothing yet. Even the tiniest amount of information that came out was enough to make them dive out of the darkness and to start attacking people while pretending they were the virtuous ones. Oh, they're just sticking up for the little guy because the multi-billion dollar corporation might have had its fee-fees hurt. Because this article has everything. The straw manning of the fans as ists. We return once again to the issue of purists. And framing that accusation in such a way which certainly isn't meant to conjure up the idea of mid-century Germans. We've got the rabid glee of a corporation just crapping on people that this author clearly thinks are inferior. While upsetting a fan base may seem like a bad thing on the surface, the truth is, enraging this particular group of followers may actually be a good sign. And a level of over-dramatized sarcasm that's so bad, you would have thought I've written it. The Rings of Power is still months away, and we're already struggling with the fact that it's going to be... <gasps> different from the source material. But my favorite part out of the entire article is that despite all of this massive length of drivel, which does nothing but crap on the very people they need to get money from, we come to the final paragraph where they basically agree with the same people they're attacking. Well, as long as you get rid of the straw man extremist opinion, which I think is held by literally nobody, Although I have to say, if I have to choose between any of the positions presented in this article, I'd still go with the one that they despise. <laughs> because despite talking in the entire article about how destroying the law is all perfectly acceptable, and in fact a good thing, we actually get to this final paragraph where they say, but the team producing the Rings of Power needs to be careful to respect the source material. Material that many avid fans think is unadaptable, no less, at all turns. Yes, this is apparently a journalist who thinks you can simultaneously destroy the material and respect it at the same time. And I have no idea how they can maintain those two ideas inside their own head, and I think the simple answer is, they don't. The reason that this bit actually exists is simply to cover them, so if anyone comes for them and points out all of the ideas in their article is trash, they just go, well, I did say the source material must be respected, at the end, and what they did is put this at the end because they know that no one else is going to be able to stand the entire article unless somebody happens to be wanting to make a YouTube video about it. But I knew this article was going to be amazing the moment I read the title. I love this title because it's so common. At this point, it's like the NPC script has just erred out and accidentally crapped out another article because we've got this. The Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power is going to upset Tolkien purists and that's a good thing. Yeah, it's going to be bad and that's that means it's good. It's like, yeah, if you think that's a rare article, it really isn't. We see these things all the time. Their Halo show is going to be nothing like the games, and that's why it's good. Or one of my personal favorites, Twilight is bad, and that's why it's good. Obviously, obviously it is. That makes sense. <laughs> Especially when in the second paragraph, it starts with, I never hated Twilight. It's good, actually. And you're like, I thought it was bad. No, it's actually good, but it is bad because we all said it's bad and that's why it's good. That person at Vice got paid to write that. <laughs> is it the most epic love story ever told? No. Well, why are you asking the question then? <laughs> But the article starts off pretty weird in itself. We know that it's going to explore areas of Middle-earth that are barely addressed in Tolkien's writings. And now the show is inventing characters, and that's necessary because of the amount of source material they're actually dealing with. I think the best counter-argument for this is if there's no source material for the time, why are you even basing anything in it to begin with? But personally, I'm not against creating new characters as long as they fit within the universe and feel like they are a part of that universe, rather than some alien thing which has been grafted onto it afterwards by some kind of external force which cares more about inserting their own thing rather than creating something which feels like the original universe. And the authors even seems to understand this when they say, in fact, Amazon Studios is going to need to take quite a few liberties with the skeletal source material, which if anything is the exact opposite of what they should be doing. If you've got a skeletal source material, that becomes even more important to maintain as it is, because if you actually start changing that, then you end up with nothing related to the universe at all, and you've basically created your own thing, and then just stamped a name on it, which to all intents and purposes seems to be what Amazon is doing. If all you've got is a tiny amount and you still can't be bothered to stick to that, then you clearly don't care at all, because that's the easiest thing to do. It's far more difficult to stick to something with a massive amount of lore like they had with the original trilogy of movies than it is to stick to something which has far less detail to it. But the author has a standard tactic. We're going to take a reasonable argument, make it the most extreme version of that possible, and then claim there's only two outcomes. 
either you're this caricature of the actual argument itself, or you completely agree with me that we can just destroy everything. When they say the material released, which is still rather paltry at best, yes, because you shouldn't judge something by its marketing, even though its marketing is specifically created for you to judge, because it's designed to be a condensed representation of what the final product will be that you will want to go and see, in theory, if they've done their job correctly, has drawn the ire of one group in particular, purists. While upsetting a fan base may seem like a bad thing on the surface, the truth is, enraging this particular group of followers may be a good sign. Because you see, new characters in Rings of Power is already a foregone conclusion. We already knew from the promotional material that Amazon Studios was going to be making a lot of new characters, and obviously that just means it's fine. You should just accept it and roll over because it's already going to happen. And if something's going to happen, that just means you should stop talking about it. I, I don't even know what the point is here. But you see, this kind of thing happens all the time, and that's why it should be allowed. Taking creative liberties like the addition of these characters, it's par for the course for most adaptations. In fact, The Wheel of Time, another Amazon blockbuster, yeah, I'd love to see those viewing figures, because you talked about that premiere and the first three episodes a lot, never spoke about any of the others. If it's such a blockbuster, Amazon, come out, show us those figures, I'm sure you definitely will. Uh, couldn't resist the temptation to add new people, like Perrin's wife and additional heirs to die even in a world overcrowded with pre-existing characters. Yes, the Wheel of Time cut existing characters that were good and replaced them with new characters that were awful, destroyed the world, and destroyed the characters. And that's a good thing! I mean, let's face it, the only good thing about Perrin's wife is that she got fridged in the first episode, so, you know, every cloud. <laughs> but the article loves to make obvious points that no one's going to disagree with. And then when you disagree with it, they're going to just jump off a cliff and then go, well, if you agreed with me with that, you must agree with me with everything else. Otherwise, you're one of them weird purist folk, aren't you? Points like adaptations naturally need to adjust the source material. And I mean, obviously, Wheel of Time books, for instance, about 24 hours long. If you want to fit that into 10 episodes of a TV series, something is going to need to be adapted. That's not what anyone is talking about. But the moment you admit that to this author, they're then going to go, See? So now we can change everything and make it not even resemble the original universe at all. I have to say at this point, who's the extremist between the two positions? I don't mind you changing small things, such as cutting scenes which aren't integral to the plot, or... I think we can just change all the characters, their personalities, invent new people, and then cram them all together in something that's so different from the original IP, it may as well be a new name. Oh yeah, and by the way, those female dwarfs, they don't need beards because characters don't even need to look like the original source material. That's right, we're going to use an argument based off time to make it so that we can change literally everything, even what the characters actually are. <laughs> but we get an insight into what the journalist thinks of Tolkien and his writing in the next paragraph, when they say creative liberties like the addition of characters are necessary in order to make Tolkien's second age story not boring. If you have read the works of Tolkien and found it boring, as far as I'm concerned, that's okay. But it does mean that any adaptations aren't for you, and uh, you probably shouldn't be watching them. They certainly shouldn't be changed to fit you, considering you weren't even a fan of the original work itself. The reason that he got a TV show or movies in the first place is because it was popular. Now, if you don't like it, that's fine. But also, those TV shows and movies shouldn't be trying to recruit you by changing what was popular just to fit you. Because what they'll probably end up with is something that you like, and all of the people that liked it originally, no longer do. The important thing to look for is if creative liberties are taking place to improve the story. Yeah, because some no-name people in a writer's room somewhere are definitely going to be able to improve the works of Tolkien. Absolutely. That's why all those writers have just major international epics to their name. Or merely change it, potentially, with other motivations in mind. And at this point, I thought, oh, maybe we're onto something. Maybe they realise that there are people out there who take traditional works and alter them with malevolent motivations because they think that something else in needs to be pushed into the future rather than traditional ideas we've had in the past. Uh, uh but not quite. In other words, are the changes taking place to contradict Tolkien's established source material? Or are they enhancing a televised version of the story for a 21st century audience? And I have to say, that's the same thing repeated twice, isn't it? Because if you're enhancing it for a 21st century audience, I would say you are changing it to contradict his established source material. Because I think we all know when they talk about a 21st century audience, they don't mean normal people. They mean the tiny fraction of people who are on Twitter who uh, have blue hair pronouns in their bio and start ranting about Floridian laws. I mean, of course, we're going to have to misrepresent something in the past, something that people like, 
and then claim it as our own, despite the fact that what we're doing bears no resemblance to the thing we're actually comparing it to. Past adaptations, including Tolkien's, have changed the source material. Oh yeah, everyone liked Peter Jackson's adaptation, and that changed it as well. Well, because making changes while trying to respect the source material as much as possible is obviously the same as taking a traditional piece of work and changing it so it fits a 21st century audience. Because one gives you a movie that represents the source material, and the other a TV show, which wouldn't look out of place on a teacher's TikTok. And then we get a weird bit which says that essentially, Tolkien understood that changes needed to be made, even though we spend three paragraphs in detail explaining how Tolkien despised adaptations. <laughs> Gotta be honest, I have no idea what they intended to achieve out of these three paragraphs. Because the pile of work that you can find which states how Tolkien despised anyone changing his work is so astronomical, uh, that's just a losing argument. One which even they had to admit, despite trying to contradict it all in the last sentence and just hope nobody noticed. But they keep trying to suggest that there are people out there that think you shouldn't be able to even change one word in an adaptation at all. And I don't think these people exist, but I do think if I had to choose between what Amazon is doing or nobody being able to change anything, then I'd go with those people every time. I mean, what's the worst that you can get there? Shakespeare has movies which are literally just word for word the exact play, so it is possible to do it. But I think we've had so many terrible adaptations like Wheel of Time, where if the alternative was that we can't do an adaptation because we can't even make a single word change, I'd just be like, yeah, fine, don't make it then. This whole idea of more content, more good, is something that I don't think many people hold true at all, except Amazon and the streaming services themselves. But they take a strange position with it when they go, we return once again to the issue of purists, instantly taking umbrage at any perceived change in an adaptation, regardless of the motivation behind the adjustment or its addition. Now, I would argue that all the people talking about the Rings of Power, it's the motivation behind why these things are being changed, which are exactly what they're taking issue with. They already proved with Peter Jackson that when the motivation for changing something is still to accurately represent something in the movies, they love those movies, so the fans have already proven when the motivation is good, they are okay with it. It's the motivation behind why on earth would you make a d female dwarf which doesn't have a beard and then try and gaslight everyone that is correct, that is what they've got an issue with. The motivation behind the Rings of Power isn't to create something which feels like it's in Tolkien's universe. The motivation here is to create something for the 21st century audience. And this author knows it. They've already stated that that's the reason why things are being changed. It's just that they, personally, think that's a good idea. So the only option they've got is pretend that these people that don't want a single word changed are actually exist, when really what it turns out is they don't want a single word changed if what you change is going to destroy the work itself because they know that you have a malevolent intention. But what we get is this. Part of the issue is that the purist moniker comes not only from the knowledge that certain fans amass, but also their penchant to use it to criticize adaptations and reinforce their own validity. I actually like this sentence because it's sort of overly wordy, over academically phrased, when all it actually means is, People with more knowledge than me are criticizing it, and it makes me feel small. <laughs> I don't like that people know more about Lord of the Rings than me. <laughs> That's right. Purists, who we've already established at this point that these purists are simply people that know more about Lord of the Rings than this author does, are often going to criticize with the use of free-wielding knowledge. Yes, oh, those Tolkien fans and their knowledge of Tolkien lore, regardless of the actual question at hand, and that's wrong. Yes, apparently, it's wrong to criticize something with your knowledge of the lore. <laughs> If you watch an adaptation, give it thought, dig it into the background, and then decide that you thoroughly dislike it. And hey, maybe it's wrong to speak for other people, but I would say, in this case, especially judging by the trailer reaction, I think everybody did. Don't worry, love, at no point will you ever be lacking for people who dislike Rings of Power. <laughs> judging an adaptation by its promotional material is akin to the old saying of judging a book by its cover. Except that's not true at all. The promotional material is literally designed to represent the end item. You are supposed to judge it, that's why it's made in the first place. Promotional material is meant to be a mini version of the thing you're going to see, so you know what the thing you're going to see is like. Just because the promotional material that's produced is awful and makes no one want to see the end goal, is just an idea that the end thing is going to be awful. 
and you can tell that by the fact that the mini version of it is also awful. And you can argue that the original teaser trailer actually didn't give you much information at all, but it was designed to show you the aesthetic representation of what that product will be. And what it turned out to be is nothing like Lord of the Rings. It wasn't accurate, it didn't respect anything about the original universe, and that's why people didn't like it. When you can't even get a dwarf right, how do you expect anyone to believe you can get something far more complicated correct? If a dwarf doesn't fit in the universe, then your story that you're fabricating certainly won't. The point is that small, simple details that should be easy to get correct are already proven to be wrong in the promotional material. And if you can't get the small things right, you're always going to fail at something which is far more complicated and difficult to fit within a universe. And then we reach the bit where they're just trying to cover themselves and go against everything they've said before. How Amazon is still on thin ice, which I think if you only have to take one look at the trailer to go, no, they're not on thin ice. They fell through that a long time ago and they're desperately deleting comments, trying to hope that nobody notices. Just because adaptations can change the source material, can, doesn't mean they should, to a degree, doesn't mean that any and all changes are permissible. I would say that changing the story for a 21st century audience is certainly something which isn't permissible. I don't want it to fit a 21st century audience, I want it to fit Tolkien's audience. There's a point where a change can go too far. Amazon can only pull off a successful adaptation if its additions and adjustments complement and enable the original story. Canon characters must be kept as accurate as possible. Notice how they don't care about their non-canon characters being kept accurate at all. You know, like the female dwarf with no beard who's really great at being out on a beach under heavy sunlight, despite never actually leaving underground. <laughs> and whether this can be done or not remains to be seen. Here's to enjoying the process of discovering enjoying. You have no idea if you'll enjoy this yet, unless you've determined that you're already going to shill for it no matter what comes out. And ultimately, objectively judging, you know, objectively judging, unlike all those fans that we've just crapped on for the entire article, what years of hard work have created. And just because you put years of hard work into something doesn't mean what you've created isn't objectively awful. And that's why I love the piece. It went all over the place. It used lots of typical arguments. And then at the end, it just went back on all of it to cover itself. So no, ma no matter what position you took, no matter what criticism you raised against them, they'd always just be able to point to that paragraph and go, no, actually, I agree that in reasonable circumstances, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, despite opening with the facts that we are actually attacking the fans, despite right at the start saying, no, enraging the fans is actually a good thing. At the end, we've obviously got to come into something which goes, oh, no, actually, we agree with all those fans where we've enraged and actually that's good. Yes. Write an article that treats people like scum, saying treating them like scum is great, and then just include something that goes, no, folks, I'm just like you after all. Yes, I'm going to enjoy it and objectively judge it. Unlike you pesky peasants over there who can't objectively do anything. I'm a journalist and that makes me far superior than you. I could put my feelings aside. Unlike you who are just obviously absorbed with your preordained ideas. The pretentious attitude of superiority isn't rare or unusual. And it's definitely something we're going to see again, because that is the journalist's typical state of being. And that is why you get so many things where it's like, oh, this is bad, and it's actually good. Oh, it's nothing like what it should be, and it's actually good. Oh, it's actually completely awful. And that's why it's good. Because it's their taste that matters. It's the emperor's new clothes. Everyone else is lining up, sniffing their own farts, and saying that this is the only way you should be. And if you disagree with us, clearly you have no idea what you're going about. The issue is, if you want to position yourself as the person that knows something that other people don't, the person who's better than everyone else, then you tend to have to hold some kind of contrarian position to everyone else. And that is how you end up defending stupid ideas that like, make absolutely no sense. Because all of the good ones have already been taken by normal people. And at that point, you end up with a journalist who has the same principal foundation as every other journalist. Never let reality get in the way of a good story. It doesn't actually matter if what you're saying is true or even makes sense, and that's why you can contradict it at the end. The only thing that matters is that you have a new, original take, which craps on all the normal people, the peasantry, so you can be elevated above them, along with all the rest of the king's cohorts, which are telling him that actually he looks great. And that's how you end up with the journalist class, the people who, I'm objective, I can judge things that you can't. 
I'm the one who should be gatekeeping the knowledge that you have access to, and the class which have fallen from grace the moment the internet existed and everyone found out ways around them to actually the truth about the situations. And that's why my first reaction to your average journalist is one of simple disdain. But what do you think? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you liked the video, press like. Subscribe. More videos like this in the future, especially about the Rings of Power as it gets closer to release. And I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.